Time now for part 28 of rebuilding a large Clarkson single cylinder vertical steam engine. This is about making the valve gear control arm. That's probably not the correct name for it, but it is the arm that controls the valve gear. It's the arm that moves the expansion link from side to side on the valve rod. And what I have to do is make one of these that actually works, because the one that was originally fitted to the engine didn't, in common with most of the things fitted to this engine. The first parts to make are the two sides. These have a slot in them, and this allows the die block to move up and down as you wind it in and out. If you didn't have a slot in there, you just had a hole, then it would bind. One of the problems with the original component is that the actual slot was not long enough. It's supposed to be 5 sixteenths of an inch, and I'm going to go slightly above that. The one that was on there was not 5 sixteenths of an inch anyway, and it was very tight. You could feel it binding as you rotated the little wheel. This one will not bind. I used the original part to sort of roughly mark out where I'm going with it, as you can see. It's quite a small slot, is that, and it's certainly not 5 sixteenths of an inch long as per the drawing. And here are a pair of freshly machined pieces. I did them together in the milling machine so both the slots are identical, and what's more, the die block fits well. It is quite important that the die block does not bind in either of the slots, and in this case it doesn't. In fact, the video makes it look slacker than it actually is. But I do not want it to bind because it's only on a 2BA thread, and if it's tight, it's just going to bend the rod. So I'm quite happy with this fit. Now it's over to the block that these two side pieces mount to. There are different ways of doing this. I could do it a really super duper engineering method and chew the whole thing out of a solid block, but then I would have to split it because I need the die block to be removable for when it wears out. So I'm using a built up construction. All will be revealed if you keep watching. This is a lump of steel and it's in the milling machine and I'm just milling it to size. This is no big deal at all. It's very easy to do. Just take it easy with the speed and do a nice slow feed. And eventually, after a couple of passes, the block is the right size. And before anybody comments, yes, I do realise that this milling cutter is in a drill chuck. It's an old Jacobs drill chuck. It's very stiff. It's past its best, but it doesn't generally drop the milling cutter. I also have a Clarkson proper milling chuck. You know, one of these things that you have to mess about with the spanner. It's really the proper tool for the job. But by the time I've messed about with the spanner and usually cut my fingers on the sharp milling cutter putting it in the collet, I can just put a small cutter into my little drill chuck and off I go. And it's on an R8 taper, which is a very strong taper, and it doesn't move and it seems to be fine. But I must say that if I was doing a serious milling job, like on a locomotive rod or anything like that, I would use the Clarkson chuck. I just could not risk the milling cutter working loose and dropping down onto the work. But for a small block like this, it's just not worth the trouble. You will be pleased to know there is no painting whatsoever in this episode, but quite a bit of milling, albeit light milling, and a bit of drilling as well. So do try and stay calm because that's later on in the episode. For the moment, I'm just cutting this block to the right size. It doesn't need to be too thick. If it was to be too thick, then the die block would rattle about. This is no good. And if it was too thin, then the die block would be clamped hard between the two pieces that are going to fasten to this. So I have to get this just right. And I'm doing this in my normal way, in my drilling chuck and generally sort of guessing how thick it needs to be. I'm really not being flippant or sarcastic, but when you do a lot of this kind of work, you develop an eye for the right thickness. There was a time when I could just about turn a quarter shaft and get it within a thou or two just by turning the wheel on the lathe. I'm just taking a quick measurement to check that everything's okay. And I also need to know where to put the slotted parts on the new piece of metal. If I get this wrong and the arm is shorter than the one that was originally fitted to the engine, then it's just not going to work. So I'm being very careful. As mentioned in the last episode, the dimension is 2 and 7 eighths of an inch. It shouldn't be that, it should be a bit shorter. But I have to follow the parts that were originally fitted to the engine. At the moment, using a centre drill, I've just been drilling a hole in the metal block. This is going to connect to the arm that drops down and fastens to the two rods that move the expansion link. After drilling an accurate pilot hole with the centre drill, as previously shown, the next part of the operation is as follows. I'm drilling a hole all the way through the piece of metal with a drill 
that is one imperial size lower than 5 sixteenths. This will then allow me to use a 5 sixteenths reamer to get a very clean finish to the hole in the work. If I'm being honest, I'm putting this reamer through the work at slightly too fast a speed, but it doesn't really matter because the pin that I'm going to make will be turned to match the diameter. And now for a bit of, without the aid of a safety net, freehand milling. Be very careful when you're doing this and only take shallow cuts. It would not be good for the part to jump out of the machine vice, or bend, or just fly across the room, or anything like that. I purposely left this block over long because I didn't know how long it was going to be until I started to assemble the parts. I quite enjoy doing this. It's a bit like carving things out of the solid, like Michelangelo's David, only with a milling machine and nothing like Michelangelo's David. Talking about carving marble statues, which I wasn't particularly talking about that, but there's something interesting that I once read. When you write at the bottom of a letter, yours sincerely, have you ever thought why you put that? When you write yours sincerely on an email or any kind of a letter, you're actually writing without wax. Sin carer, S-I-N-C-E-R-E, means without wax, and I do believe it's Latin. It might be Greek, but it's certainly not English. Why would you want to write without wax on the bottom of a letter? It's nothing to do with sealing wax or anything like that. As far as I'm aware, this term comes from a time period when people made statues. If they were the modern equivalent of a cowboy builder, what they would do is fill the imperfections in the statue with wax. So if the sculptor accidentally knocked the nose off when he was sculpting the statue, instead of having to start again, he'd simply rebuild the nose with wax. But then, of course, after a short while, with temperature variations, the wax would drop out and the statue would look what it was, terrible. So that is why you write yours sincerely, yours without wax, to say, I'm a thoroughly good person and if I make a statue for you, I will not fill it with wax so the nose and ears of the statue, as well as any other parts, will not fall off, because they're held on with wax. You learn something new every day, and you also learn how to renovate steam engines from my videos. Right, so here's the pieces loosely fitted together. They're all going to be cleaned up, they look a bit manky at the moment, but they'll soon be cleaned up on a piece of sandpaper. I'll clean them up on the linisher first, and then finally clean them up with wet or dry sandpaper. The parts should look quite good. There's still quite a way to go though, but as you can see, the mechanical principle is there. On to the next part, I've rounded the edges of the two side pieces, now I'm measuring and marking out for the holes to be drilled. And once I've drilled these holes, I will countersink them to take two countersink bolts like this. These are 6BA bolts that will then in turn pass through the thick piece, which is the middle, but they will be threaded into the other side. So I'm going to drill the other side, tapping size, and tap the part 6BA. And if you're doing this, don't do what I did. I broke the tap off in the hole, but it quickly came out. Luckily, it was only just in the hole. You've got to be very, very gentle with steel and 6BA taps. They are very small. Always buy good quality taps, and I generally do that. But for some reason, I was just a bit ham-fisted and broke it. But luckily, I got the broken bit out and just started again with a new tap. Here you see me cleaning up the nearly finished part on a piece of 400 grade wet or dry sandpaper, but what I did before I did this was go onto the linisher and cut it to shape. As you can see, it's nicely tapered. It's not square and ugly anymore. There's still a fair way to go on this. There's a bit more cleaning up to do, and I'll do that when I make the other part in the next episode. But as you can see, it's looking quite good. Once I've fitted the die block for a quick test, it's really smooth, it's just how I want it to be. No tight spots, it goes all the way up and down the slot, so it's a vast improvement from what it was. I freely accept it is not identical to the construction on the drawing, but it works, it works fine. And it's more or less the right shape, it sits on the drawing, which means it's the right size, and most of all, it will make the engine work. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.